This is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward. Welcome to the legislature today. I'm Randy Yoey. This is the 10th day of the 60 day 2024 regular session. We have a retrospective show as we end the week. We started our coverage with Governor Jim Justice's State of the State Address, and then we spoke with Delegate Sean Hornbuckle and Senator Mike Caputo for the minority response. Here's some highlights from that conversation. Let's start out with just a general perception of what you heard last night from the governor. Well, you know, the governor said a lot, but I feel like the overarching tone was a lot of collaboration. He really touted tourism, diversifying the economy. And if we could start there, uh, Think about this. I mean, the Biden administration has been huge with pumping dollars into West Virginia. But then when you, you know, take that down a notch, Senator Joe Manchin, Shelley Moore Capito, they have worked together in a bipartisan manner to help deliver those goods to the state of West Virginia. And then with the leadership of the Speaker in the House, Roger Hanshaw, also Senate Craig, uh, President Craig Blair, he's helped a lot. But they've put a plan together that's involved both Democrats and Republicans, Marshall University, West Virginia, West Virginia State. And again, that has been the tone that if we work together, we can really do this thing. Senator Caputo, what stood out to you? Well, I think uh, Minority Leader Hornbuckle uh, uh, elaborated on how we're trying to work together and do good things for West Virginia. Some of the ideas that the governor uh, put out front have been Democratic ideas for years. <laughs> And, and I'm happy to see that finally someone's taking those ideas and running with them, like eliminating the tax totally on Social Security. That will help so many retired West Virginians. We want to, we always talk about how we want to help our seniors, and sometimes, you know, we talk a lot more than, than we do. This will really help a lot of people who's living on Social Security benefits, a, a, a Democratic proposal that's been around for years and years and years. And, of course, child tax credit, which is near and dear to my minority leader, Senator Wolfel, was talked about and that's another democratic uh, uh, initiative that we want to make sure we take care of parents who have to pay for child care but go out and work and, and take care of their families as well. So those are two things that were very, very, uh, very, very uh, important to me. Last night we heard the governor talk a little bit about school choice, talked about a certain amount of money that would go to enhance charter schools, yet he spent a lot of time talking about the value of public schools and people should be involved. Uh, what about the Democrats? How do you feel on that? Well, you know, I certainly think it's a horrible idea to take public money and invest in charter schools. These were supposed to be profitable schools, which we, uh, as Democrats, didn't like this whole plan of taking taxpayer dollars away from the masses to benefit the very few. Well, now it appears as though these charter schools are not profitable, so we want to throw some more state money at that. I, I think the public should be uh, concerned deeply about that proposal, and I think that money should stay in the public schools. And I do appreciate what the governor said about public schools. I just wish that we would focus more on the dollars going to public schools. You don't want to outlaw school choice completely. No, we don't want to outlaw it completely. And, and we understand the value of a parent being able to choose for their child. However, when the governor comes out, we appreciate him saying he wants education to be the centerpiece. Well, it's time we start doing. And with the money that we're spending elsewhere, we need to make meaningful pay raises for our teachers, which is so important to us. But also we have found with the Hope Scholarship, there has been dollars, taxpayer dollars, that is leaving our state today, Randy, to go fund Ohio, PA, Maryland, with these private schools, that is money leaving our public education system. We heard a laundry list of spending proposals that the governor gave last night. Um, and the big ones were $100 million to hospitals, $150 million for school building authority, but only $15 million to fund fire and EMS. That doesn't, does that balance? We, we philosophically disagree with that math. Uh, our volunteer fire departments, I mean, come on. They are part of the backbone of our first responders. I mean, they're doing so much, especially for our small rural communities. We have to pony up more money, we just simply put. 
But correction still remains in a state of emergency. I think there's still more than 350 National Guards men and women that are filling in at our jails and prisons. Last night, the governor came out with a little surprise there and said, you know, and I know we have 277 jobs that we filled over the last six months or so, and that, that's not a bad number at all. But he said that by the end of the summer, he expected to have all those National Guards folks out of our jails and prisons. Doable? So that is something that I do appreciate that the governor talked about last night. Uh, but again, it goes back to we got to do more and we've got to we got to be able to do it quicker. Um, they are hurting inside there. Uh, we've got to get relief to our correction officers. But we also, Randy, we've got to do something about the conditions in our facilities. The conditions in our facilities are substandard. Uh, it is detrimental uh, uh, to not just the inmates, but the workers in there. So the increments on pay has just been boosted up. I mean, what it was six, six million and six million last year and, and not a lot of pay for the middle management folks. Some of them just got two hundred and fifty dollars and we're too happy about that. They'd been there 15 years. Some of these uh, officers have been there, too, and they were getting, you know, thousands of dollars where others were getting hundreds. And let us not forget about our southern partners. All right. I know a lot of folks down there, McDowell County, some of their officers are contracted. So they were not able to enjoy in, in some of those pay raises. And, and so we cannot forget about them as well. Very, very important. We do not forget about our southern coal fields. And when you talk about conditions, Senator Caputo, uh, you see Commissioner Marshall saying that, you know, for example, that uh, the gymnasiums during COVID were just used for storage and stuff. He said that clean them all out, get to some exercise equipment back there. Uh, 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 an, an, an inmate that's able to exercise as a happier inmate makes a happier place. Is he on the right track with what he's doing? Well, I think he is, but we have a long way to go. You know, we need to re rehabilitate. Yes. We need to look yes. at nonviolent uh, offenders that are spending long, long periods of time in jail and see what we can do to rehabilitate those folks, get them out, make them productive citizens again. That's what we need to do. Not just sticking someone in a jail isn't the answer for West Virginia. We've got to rehabilitate. It's our job to rehabilitate and to have them to be a function member of society that benefits all of us. We can't have them in conditions that are counterproductive to them coming out. Um, changing the transfer rule for high school kids. I know you're a coach. Yes. Uh, can that be done? It can be done, but again, like I've said before, it's got to be very nuanced. I don't know if we can just do it this session. I would like to. It would be a goal of ours. But as I've said before, what is happening right now does not work but also for the sake of the student athlete and their opportunities after high school for educational opportunities, we can't just go back to the previous way. We need a new system that works better for everyone involved. On Monday, we spoke with Speaker of the House Roger Hanshaw on some of his expectations for the 2024 general session. Here's a section of that conversation. You have developed in the House a special select committee, excuse me, on artificial intelligence. I talked to Delegate Maynor a bit, your co-chair this morning, but tell me the whole philosophy behind setting up this committee and, and what you hope to accomplish. Well, the goal is to get out in front of that issue, Randy. It, it's, it's going to be transformative. It, it's, it's one of these issues that seems to have come on the scene at a pace that, that most of the world wasn't predicting. It's, it's been one of those things that's been in development for decades now. We've all called automation made it hotlines for, for a decade now and, and on the other end of the phone's been a robot or has been a computer. That was a, that was a form of artificial intelligence in its evolutionary stages. Fast forward a year till, till we reach, to reach chat GPT and generative yeah. artificial intelligence now. And, and we in the house want to get out in front of this topic. We want to be at the leading edge of it and ask questions like how do we prepare the state of West Virginia's public education system to capitalize on artificial intelligence? How do we use artificial intelligence tools to provide services to West Virginians? Can we, can we speed up the process of renewing someone's vehicle registration using AI tools? And the, the select committee we created last Wednesday is designed to do that. They're designed to be exploratory. Their charge is to just ask big questions, to ask open-ended questions, to bring experts here to the Capitol during 
the course of this 60 day session and perhaps thereafter and just just ask the big question how do we capitalize on this growing and evolving area of technology you know John Chambers who is a, a, a storied West Virginian chair chairman and CEO of Cisco and really took that company from from a sleepy little IT company to one of the most valuable companies in the world John said in an interview recently that he believed the impact of artificial intelligence on the world would exceed and surpass the overall impact of the internet on the world. Now think about that for a minute. Wow. Think about how many ways the internet impacts our lives every single day. John, who is an expert in the field by any measure, has predicted that the, the tools of AI will surpass even, even the impact of the internet. We need to be at the front of that. This is an eye-opening uh, thought because most people when they hear about artificial, in artificial intelligence to have a negative connotation but you just listed off five positives and I, th I don't think that the regular general public has that concept. Well that's that's one of the charges of the committee is to look for positive ways to implement this technology. We know it's going to be disruptive. It's already been disruptive. The question is, can we can we use that disruption in a way that's 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 productive? Uh, Pre President Smith at Marshall University is 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 often often heard to say, change will either happen through you or happen to you, <laughs> and we want it to happen through us. Makes good sense. Let's stick with technology and talk about cybersecurity. I know that you're a big fan of the 47 million million dollar Center for Cyber Cybersecurity that's being set up at Marshall University. I sure am. And during the look ahead, you talked about advocating a piece of legislation from the House this year that relates to consumer privacy, data privacy, cybersecurity protocols for private businesses. So talk about how that cybersecurity enhancement might come about. This is important, Randy. This has grown directly out of our Choose West Virginia initiative. Uh, our, our most recent stop on that tour was a two-day visit to the offices of Amazon Web Services and Microsoft in Seattle. And on that visit, we heard two of the world's leading IT companies talk to us about the importance of putting in place Protect, data protection protocols and cybersecurity protocols to make sure that the, 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 the reams and volumes and tomes of data that we generate here in the course of the daily business of running state government are protected. And we, we, see, we see example after example around the world of companies held hostage by ransomware, right. of, 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 of healthcare facilities, of schools, of universities, of, of businesses that are locked down and forced to pay ransom to, to nefarious actors around the world. We want to make sure that we're, again, doing what we can do as a state government to, number one, protect our own data, protect ourselves, protect the data that we're charged with, with controlling here. But also to make sure that West Virginians are protecting themselves and that the business owners here in West Virginia, those who operate in our state, are, are incented to, to deploy cybersecurity protections and cyber cybersecurity data protection tools. Our Committee on Technology and Infrastructure will almost certainly be working on that perhaps as early as next week. Let's do a third arm of technology because I don't think everybody still understands what LG is going to be at doing at Marshall and in Morgantown. Is it, is it really, is it a think tank that we're talking about here that, that's going to springboard on, on ideas and technology for the future? This is a great one, Randy. So the, the LG investment here, the $700 million that LG announced two weeks ago that they would invest here in West Virginia, really represents the, the completion of the circle. So we've come, we, we've, we've completed the circle now in our transition to a true 21st century economy. So rather than just recruiting manufacturing to West Virginia, rather than just recruiting companies Right. Companies and organizations that will utilize natural resources in downstream manufacturing, all of which are important and all of which we want to see more of. LG is a technology company. LG is, is an innovation engine. They, they, they effectively are to the world in the 21st century what GE was to the world in the 20th century. They're, they're a monolithic global conglomerate. And their investment here in West Virginia is going to take a number of forms. Number one, they're going to have a manufacturing component. So they will be manufacturing electronic devices here in West Virginia. LG makes okay. the television hanging right. in my office. They make the TVs my in home. my home. Right. They're, they're a, a, house, a true household name. But they're also a global research powerhouse. And that's, that's the piece of the LG investment here that really is of interest to me. So LG's committed that part of their investment here will be a research center employing, employing dozens, if not hundreds, of scientists and engineers at six-figure salaries right here in West Virginia in partnership with our two major universities.
On Tuesday, West Virginia Public Broadcasting News Director Eric Douglas spoke with Senate President Craig Blair about his visions and goals for the 2024 session. Let's watch and listen. The expectations are to keep the momentum going in the state of West Virginia. In my lifetime, I don't believe that we've ever experienced better economic opportunities, better growth, better opportunities for change in the state of West Virginia to be able to propel us into the future. And uh, I'm proud of the work that we've done over the last eight years or ten years, whatever it may be, and it's growing. Uh, and that's exciting, uh, investing into the infrastructure, uh, investing in education, getting a drug-free, educated workforce that's ready to go to work, stay in West Virginia. Virginia and uh, people laugh at me when I say this but if you keep our youth here what happens is they have children they have families that's how you grow a state that's how you grow an economic base that you can actually have further tax reductions and keep the momentum moving forward I'm old enough to remember we used to refer to the the uh, I-77 South headed to Charlotte is kind of the, it was the hillbilly highway as we talked about. Everybody was growing up and leaving the state. What what can we do to, to keep people in the state? It was our number one export for that matter, uh, is our youth for gainful employment. Look, I'm from the eastern panhandle and everybody thinks that we're wealthy over there and they know what it is is that there's a lot of people that's wanting to get out of the state of Maryland, to get out of Washington D.C. and those markets and uh, West Virginia is very, very attractive for that because our people are great and the people moving there are great. But you got to be able to have the jobs. When I was growing up, there was GM, 3M, DuPont, Corning, the list went on and they all left. Why? Because they were taxed out of the state. Then we turned into a bedroom community. You cannot have a tax base to be able to do that. And we were like a barometer for the rest of the state. We were hemorrhaging jobs out of the sure. state. And when you lose the jobs and the upward mobility and the economic opportunities, people leave. Uh, the two most mobile things in our society is labor and capital. And we're attracting both now to the state of West Virginia. And that's how you keep your, our youth here. You don't have to worry about school closings or, or, or riffing teachers uh, or consolidations. What you worry about is, is the fact that you got more young people in the system and those children coming through and you got a tax base. You got, you're able to pay the teachers more and the state employees more, school service personnel more. And we've been doing that uh, over the last eight to 10 years. Well, I'm proud of what we've sure. done. Last year, you passed a pretty pretty amazing tax cut for the for the state. I mean, and amazing in the, in the scale of it. I, I guess is what I want to say. Um, what seven hundred and eighty million dollars? I think was roughly. Has that worked out as you expected? I mean, I know it's only been a year, but as it as it, are you seeing the fruition of that? Yes, it'll work out. Uh, I'm not concerned by that. And, and by the way, I was the author of the flatline budget where four years, it was me and the name Eric. Uh, Eric Nelson was the finance chairman for the House side, then Eric Householder, and then I've got Eric, or had Eric Householder and Eric Tarr. Uh, but by controlling our spending, and this is exactly what the federal government should do, they should actually control the spend and let the revenues grow. And when we did that, that afforded us the opportunity to be able to go in and do the tax reductions. I said that we'd have six, seven, eight hundred million dollars. We did. Actually, we had one point eight million dollars. Problem with that is, is that we were using severance tax. The severance tax made up almost a billion of those excess revenues. They're down this year. Right. The production is up, both coal and gas, but the prices are down. The most beautiful part about what we got going on right now is we're really not budgeting the severance tax. I can remember when I was first elected in 2003 where we were underwater, we were cutting in the middle of the year, and they were hoping somebody would win the record Powerball, and they did. But that's no way to run, that's no way to run a state. Uh, run yeah. a government, run a state. We have changed those, all those dynamics, and then you can see the people's wages are up, the job opportunities. One of our new features on the legislature today is the addition of two high school journalists to our show to help our younger audience better understand how government works. This week, they examine how the West Virginia legislature is comprised and the initial process of a bill becoming a law. Hello, I am Ben Velo. And I'm Amira Mustafa. As our elected officials are drafting bills, we will be discussing how a bill becomes a law and the committee process. But first, how are bills proposed? 
both delegates and senators draft bills and propose them on either the House or Senate floor. Afterwards, the bill will be assigned to a specific committee depending on the content. It is important to note that any bill that involves state revenue will always be referred to a finance committee. Committees are a specialized group of legislators tasked with examining specific issues, proposing legislation, and overseeing government functions. Each committee has a chairman who serves as the leader of that committee. One of their most important responsibilities is determining if and when each bill is considered by the members. The committee members will study, discuss, and hold a vote on whether to advance the bill to the House or Senate. When a bill is passed in one chamber, it is sent to the other chamber and the process begins again. Some bills die in committee, meaning that the committee either did not have enough time to consider it or decided the bill should not be passed. West Virginia has seven types of committees in both the Senate and the House. Standing, select, whole, conference, sub, interim, and oversight and investigative. Standing committees are permanent committees that focus on specific policy areas. For example, our government will always fund education, so there's a standing committee for education in both the House and the Senate. In contrast, select committees are only temporary. Their purpose is to investigate particular issues, presenting their findings and recommendations to the entire body, and upon fulfilling their designated tasks, the select committee will be dissolved. Both standing and select committees are made up of a specialized group of legislators, but committees of the whole are made up of all 100 delegates or 34 senators. The purpose of these meetings is to allow for a more open discussion. Because a bill must be passed in both chambers, there are often disagreements between the House and the Senate. Conference committees, which uniquely include both senators and delegates, focus on resolving those issues. But don't worry, conference committees are composed of an equal number of senators and delegates. Once these issues are resolved, the bill is sent back to both chambers and the conference committee is dissolved. Within committees, chairs can create what is called subcommittees and they focus on even more specific issues. These specific issues often span longer than the 60 days of the legislative session. Interim committees meet once a month between regular sessions to research relevant issues that may be addressed in the next legislative session. Oversight and investigative committees are focused on the general operation in these state agencies. Sometimes this can mean investigating problems that are found within. Basically, committees meet to edit, discuss, and tailor laws in the legislative branch, ensuring they benefit all citizens, even the ones who can't or don't vote. Knowing more about the committee process helps us analyze bills that are being discussed right now. For instance, Bill 4637 is currently being discussed in the House under the Standing Education Committee. The chairman for that committee is Republican Delegate Joe Ellington. Sponsored by Delegate Kayla Young, Bill 4637 proposes a grant program for colleges that establish themselves as student need campuses. More than one in three students at West Virginia University are food insecure, and more than 14% of students at two-year colleges are homeless. This bill would establish a system in these campuses to help those affected students. After being taken to committee immediately after its introduction on the House floor, this bill will wait for the chairman to take it up. From there, the committee will choose to endorse it or vote it down. If successful, the bill will re-enter the House floor for three readings and a final vote. If this bill passes the process, it will move up to the Senate and start all over again. So join us next Friday, where we will be discussing this bill amongst others that pass through the West Virginia legislature. And join us as we take a dive into the role of lobbyists in our government. As always, I'm Amira Mustafa. And I'm Ben Velo. For the legislature today. Over the past summer and fall, the House of Delegates Chamber was completely renovated for only the second time since the Capitol was dedicated in 1932. The chamber was aesthetically and technically refurbished while maintaining its historic luster. Let's take a look. Every one of the 190-year-old black walnut desks was hand-sanded and refinished. The carpet was replaced. Walls were repaired, repainted, and the marble cleaned. Clerk of the House Steve Harrison says the renovation was long overdue. This is an important place to keep looking as it should. We get so many guests in here, so many tourists stopping in. This gives them an impression of our state and it needed a renovation, and it's going very well. Some delegates had struggled in the past with an acoustically inferior sound system. They should struggle no more with new speakers, new microphones, and a full system tune-up. We actually moved the speakers in to reduce some of the bouncing off the walls. We have new sound panels, all new sound panels down here. We also added sound panels in the galleries because a sound test was done, and sound was bouncing around in the galleries. So the house chamber hasn't been fully renovated since 1995. The 
Back then, I'm told, there were still brass spittoons along the aisles. I don't think they were used. And delegates could mosey back here to the vestibule to sneak a smoke. Harrison says the renovation was done with all due respect to the chamber's history. We consulted with uh, Historic Preservation, then went to the Capitol Building Commission to get approval on the things we had planned. The $2.36 million renovation was done mostly by the same vendors who updated the chamber in 1995. Thank you for spending this time with us. Catch the legislature today, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. And remember, West Virginia Public Broadcasting covers the session daily in our radio news program, West Virginia Morning, and on our news site at wvpublic.org. We also broadcast the daily floor sessions of both the House and Senate on the West Virginia Channel. I'm Randy Yoey. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a great and safe weekend. Support for the legislature today is provided by West Virginia University, offering education, health care, and the opportunity to achieve career success since 1867. Information at go.wvu.edu slash forward.